Hello everyone, Mr. Waz here, and welcome to another episode of Wazly Science. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the Earth and the solar system. I'm really excited about this. You know, I've been thinking, what if humans weren't the dominant species on Earth that are controlling everything? What if it was like some kind of other animal? What would that be like? Huh, yeah, I guess that's a good point. All right, well, let's get started. In this presentation, I'm going to be covering uh, two of the Earth and Solar System DCIs, as well as a physical science standard, uh, which is the energy and chemical processes in everyday life. These are the six topics that I'm going to be covering in this presentation. We have Kepler's Law, Gravity, Rotation, Revolution, and Tilt of the Earth, as well as the other planets in our solar system. We're going to be talking about Milankovitch cycles and how the Earth is hit with radiation by the Sun in different ways. And we're going to end this presentation with ice ages. What we have here is I want to show you uh, what different pieces of equipment that are used to help us understand our solar system. On the bottom here we have the Gemini Observatory which is a very powerful telescope that's used on the surface of Earth in order to help us understand the solar system. In the middle here we have the International Space Station which is a satellite that re that revolves around the Earth that people live on for several months. People from all around the world work together, scientists, to run experiments in space. And all the way to the right we have the very well-known Hubble Space Telescope. This is one of our most powerful telescopes and it, it, it's a satellite that spins around the Earth that has helped us see galaxies from very, very, very far away. There are three Kepler's laws and their purpose is to help us understand the behavior of planetary movement around a sun, but they also relate to how moons and satellites revolve around a planet. The first one is called the Law of Orbits, and this states that all planets move in elliptical orbit with the Sun at one focus. The second law is called the Law of Areas, and this states that a line that connects a planet to the Sun sweeps out equal areas in equal times. The third law is the Law of Periods, and this states that the square of the period of any planet is proportional to the cube of a semi major axis of the orbit. Let's break down these laws into more detail now. First you have the law of orbits. So there's some vocabulary that you need to understand with this law. First you have the perihelion, and the perihelion is when the planet is actually the closest to the sun. So it's basically the distance from here to the center of the sun. And then you have aphelion, and aphelion is when the planet is farthest from the sun. So it's basically the distance from here all the way to here. And so in this example here, the orbit is very ellipse-shaped. So a word to describe how a certain orbit is ellipse-shaped is called the eccentricity. So eccentricity is basically a number, and the higher the eccentricity, the more ellipse-shaped your orbit is. When your eccentricity is zero, that means that the orbit is in a perfect circle. And some planets are actually very close to that, but none of them are at perfect zero. And um, something to note, something that's pretty interesting is that Pluto has the largest eccentricity of any planet. So this law just basically uh, helps you mathematically figure out the elliptical shape of a planet. The second law involves a law of areas. And what this one states is really interesting. So when a planet is closer to the sun, when it's at its perihelion, it actually moves faster. And when it's really far away from the sun, it's losing that gravitational force. It's not as strong. So it becomes weaker. Therefore, the planet revolves around the sun at a slower pace. And so what ends up happening is that the speed of the planet changes throughout the year that it's revolving around the sun. So if we take these purple circles, what you have to realize is that every purple circle was taken 
at this at a same time pace although there are different distances from one another they were taken like let's say for example every month so every one month a, a, cir a purple circle was marked here and what you see is that this area this if you take the area of this triangle here you you know how to calculate areas of a triangle I'm sure right a squared plus b squared equals c squared and stuff like that Pythagorean theorem whatever it's called but this area ends up being equal to this area here as well as this area and this area all these areas create the same number which is really cool so if we look at a gif file of this we can see that when the planet is farthest from the so the sun's right here right this is the focal point so when the planet is farthest from the sun it slows down a little bit and when it's closest it speeds up and when if you take if you look at the pink part here if you take any of these areas they all come out to the exact same number so that's what the second law states okay so Kepler's third law has to do with periods now what's a period a period is the amount of time it takes for a planet to go all the way around the Sun so it takes one year for Earth so we can compare that time with other planets and we find that when you take when you square the amount of time it takes to go around the Sun so that'd be orbital period here and you cube the semi-major axis which if you forgot what that is go back to Kepler's first law because it shows that on the diagram it's basically the distance from the planet on its orbit to the center of its ellipse and if you cube that number it actually makes a linear line for our planets this uh, law is very mathematical what you're gonna want to do is the T's here represent the periods and the R's represent the semi-major axis so when you let's say if you are trying to figure out you're trying to figure out how long it takes for Jupiter to go around the Sun so that would be the T2 so what you do is plug in what you know you plug in you put a 1 here for Earth because it takes one period and then you leave that as T I mean you gotta square 1 which 1 times 1 is 1 still and then you go over here to the R and you gotta cube um, the semi-major axis of Earth and then cube the semi-major axis of Venus and when you do all the math out you can figure out how many years it takes for Jupiter to go around the Sun and you can do that with any of the numbers so that's that's what the third law has to do so if you are getting confused with this material on Kepler's laws don't worry because we are doing a lab on all three of these laws let's talk about gravity now so gravity is a force that pulls on an object it pulls objects toward each other what's really interesting about gravity is you might think of something like oh gravity is a lot like magnetism or it's a lot like how protons and electrons uh, attract each other but it's not because gravity only pulls objects together it never repels like when you have two magnets and you take the north and south they attract but if you take the north and north they repel same thing with with submetallic particles if you take a proton and an electron okay they attract but if you take an electron and an electron they repel so gravity doesn't have that sort of repulsion to it it's just attraction and the amount of gravitational force on two objects depends on how much mass the two objects have so in this diagram we see here m1 the blue sphere has uh, more mass than the green sphere so what's going to end up happening is that the blue sphere is going to be pulling the green sphere towards it more than the green sphere is going to be pulling the blue sphere so the green the the blue sphere will end up moving a lot less because it's going to pull the green sphere towards it now the biggest factor of gravity is the distance between the two objects so the farther away two objects get from one another the less gravitational pull they have on each other let's get into like mass and weight okay so in orbit no matter where you go no matter what planet what moon wherever you are in space you always have the same mass what changes is something called your weight and in America we use these words like the wrong way all the time 
I guess we don't really care because we don't really travel to different planets and moons and such. But anyway, what happens is if you go into orbit like in the International Space Station where you see the astronauts floating all the time is that they all have the same amount of mass but they have less weight and they have less weight because since they're farther away from the earth the gravity is pulling on them less than it does when we're here on the surface so they become weightless now when an object is fallen towards earth it accelerates towards the ground at a speed of 9.8 meters per second square you might have experienced this before if you'd like done some cliff jumping maybe and you you notice that like in those last few seconds before you're going to hit the water that you were going really really fast that was like the fastest point that you're going that's what i mean by that we accelerate towards the earth the it's like when a baseball is coming back down it is really fast right before it's going to hit the earth now um what's really interesting is something called terminal velocity so if you're like parachuting from an airplane and you're heading towards the earth eventually you accelerate so much that you can't even go faster so you don't just go faster and faster forever you reach this speed called terminal velocity which is the fastest you could possibly go so then you have escape velocity now escape velocity is i took if i took like a rock or something and i threw it like wicked hard i i could never pull this off no one on earth could but let's just say in theory that you threw this rock at 11 uh kilometers per second which is just nuts but let's say you did it um you this rock wouldn't ever come back it would just go into space and there it would go it would never plunge back down to earth and another thing about gravity to understand here is you might be wondering why hasn't the earth ever crashed into the sun why haven't satellites crashed into the earth so if we look at this diagram here it shows that the earth is weighing down like the space-time continuum and what ends up happening is it creates that gravitational field at the same time the satellites are also experiencing inertia so they want to move forward at a very fast pace um, I think a satellite can go around the earth in about 90 minutes they make several trips around the earth in a day and the so the satellite is gonna is trying to move forward but it's also being pulled at a sort of equilibrium so that causes it to orbit that's the same reason why the earth does not plunge itself and incinerate into the sun is because we are trying to move forward but every time we try to move forward and away from the sun the sun pulls us and it creates an ellipse one last thing about gravity that's really crazy is that photons which are particles of light they have no mass but yet they can still be influenced by gravity and they'll bend towards the object's influence which is how we were able to find black holes we need to establish some basic vocabulary when it comes to planets orbiting around a sun. So first off, it's rotation. Rotation is how long it takes for a planet to rotate once on its axis. Earth takes 24 hours. This is our day. Then there's revolution. There's a difference between rotation and revolution. Revolution is how long it takes for a planet to run its full ellipse around the sun. The Earth takes 365.25 days. Now that 25, that those extra six hours, that's why we have a leap year. Is every four years we just take that those six hours and we clump them together in a day, and it works out pretty smoothly. Now with tilt, tilt is the angle that the planet spins in orbit. Earth has a 23.5 degree tilt. And this tilt is the reason for our seasons. There's a huge miss. This is one of the biggest misconceptions in the world. People think that we have seasons because we're farther away from the sun at a certain point in the year, and that's our winter, and then we're closer to the sun, and that's our summer. That's not true at all. Think about it this way. When you know that when we have summer, Australia, which is in the southern hemisphere, has their winter, and vice versa. 
So that wouldn't make any sense if we were closer to the sun and it was summer because then Australia would also have summer too. It has to do with our till. So if we look at this diagram here, this might help you understand. So if you look at the right, okay, you can see that our north pole here is tilted towards the sun. Now this isn't to scale, it's not like the sun's only that big, so don't get overwhelmed here. Um, but then you can see that the southern hemisphere is tilted away. So what ends up happening, and then you can see that this half of the Earth is receiving, is receiving sunlight and then the other half's not, but it's also rotating. So what you gotta understand here is what ends up happening is that the, north, the northern hemisphere ends up receiving more than 12 hours of light a day whereas the southern hemisphere receives less. And then when you get to um, the fall equinox, okay, the autumn equinox, we actually, um, everywhere on Earth receives 12 hours of light, 12 hours of night. And then in our winter solstice, we our tilt is tilted away towards the sun. However, for the southern hemisphere, they're now tilted towards the sun. So that's why they have their summers when we have our winters. So hopefully this makes sense for you because this is really important and this is like a huge misconception in the world. In fact, I challenge you right now to press pause, go find your parents and ask them why we have seasons. I'm going to assume that most of your parents know, but you would be surprised on how many people don't understand why we have seasons. We'll do a surveying class too, so make sure that you do that. So now let's take a look at this table. It's really interesting. It shows all of the planets and rotation, revolution, tilt, eccentricity, and density all together. It's very fascinating. And again, it's showing all the planets. Ugh, Pluto, don't do this to me. You know you're just a dwarf planet. You're not really a planet. Okay, fine. We'll include Pluto. What the heck? I could talk about information on this table for a very long time, but what I'd like you to do is to take a look at this and write down at least five fascinating things that you found about the planets in terms of their rotation, revolution, their tilt, their eccentricity, and their density. Something that you notice, like what you know, what's a planet that rotates very, very slowly but revolves fast or a planet that has an extreme tilt, what would life on that planet be like? Or a planet that has very little to new, no eccentricity, or a planet that has a ton of eccentricity. Or just look at density. Which planet is the most dense? How does that surprise you? So I'd like you to write down at least five fascinating things you found about this table and have that ready so we can share that in class. Electromagnetic energy, also known as radiation, from the sun travels through empty space to hit Earth. And the surfaces of the Earth receive this energy differently dependent on a variety of things. Let's first talk about color. So the polar ice caps reflect radiation back to space. They're white, they're shiny. This is called the albedo effect. This is a very important concept. Make sure that you have this polished down because you're gonna see the albedo effect come back when we get into geology this year. Now darker surfaces, like if you had uh, basalt, which is a rock, that absorbs heat. Now, on the contrary, darker colors also lose their heat faster. So the basalt would actually lose the heat as soon as the sun goes down. And then the ice caps, it'll actually retain and hold on to heat longer than the dark surfaces would. Then you have specific heat capacity. This is a certain number that every material has a certain heat capacity. And so the higher that this number is, the longer it takes for that substance to heat up, but also that substance is able to retain its heat longer. Water has a very high specific heat capacity. And this allows water to take a long time to heat up, but it also will hold on to that heat for a long time. And it's just the opposite for land. Land can heat up faster during the day, but as soon as the sun goes down, it's gonna lose its heat very quickly. You probably have noticed this when you've been at a beach. During the summer, the water might not be as hot as the sand on the beach. 
that's because the sand is heating up very quickly and the water is not going to heat up. And then you go back to the beach at night and the water is all of a sudden a lot warmer than the air because it's able to retain that heat. And the beach sand is now very cold because it lost that heat. Duration is another part. So the Earth's tilt makes the amount of sunlight throughout the year vary. In the higher latitude that you go, the larger that there's a variation. So the equator, which is the lowest latitude you can get, zero, has around 12 hours of sunlight every single day throughout the year. And then if you go to the North Pole, that's where this GIF file comes from, that is the North Pole at summer solstice. The sun doesn't actually set, it just kind of dances in the sky over time. Now if you went to the North Pole on its winter solstice, the sun would never rise and it just stays dark for a couple days. Then you have angle. So again, it's related to the Earth's tilt, but this is also different. At the higher latitudes, so I'm talking about this area here, the higher latitudes receive more of angled sunlight. And so that angled sunlight causes the radiation to be spread out over a larger area. And so they receive less direct sun. And so when you receive sunlight that is less direct, it means that the radiation is spread out and it doesn't get as hot. So that's why the equator is really, really hot. It's because the sun is directly beaming on the equator. Whereas in the high latitudes, the Arctic and the Antarctic, the sun is very angled, so their sunlight isn't as strong. Then we can get into cloud coverage. So clouds reflect and they scatter heat, send in radiation back to space. And this is very important for us. This helps us not get too hot. And on the other side of it, at night, clouds can help trap heat and keep the night to not be too cold. If you were out during the day and it was cloudy, you may notice that it's not as hot as when it's a clear day. And then at night, if it's cloudy at night, it's actually still kind of warm, whereas if you have a clear night, hey, you can see all the stars and that's really great, but better bring a sweatshirt because it's going to be cold. It wasn't until junior year in college that I learned about Milankovitch cycles, so you guys are really ahead of the game here. Back to this word eccentricity. The reality is that the eccentricity of the Earth has actually changed throughout Earth's history. We have had the Earth have more in a lip shape, and we have also had the Earth's orbit be more circular shape. And what that means is that there have been points in which the Earth has been farther away from the Sun, and there have also been points in which the Earth has been closer to the Sun. Now, the other quality about the Earth that has changed is the Earth's tilt. We have seen the Earth's tilt be as low as 22.2 degrees and as high as 24.5 degrees. And last, a new word for us, precession. Precession is the gradual change or wobble in the orientation of the Earth's axis. What that basically means is that the exact location of the North and the South Pole do, in fact, change. And so these three qualities about the Earth change in Earth's history, which can cause drastic changes to the Earth's climate. It will cause drastic changes to the amount of radiation that the, that the Earth is receiving from the Sun, that has to do specifically with eccentricity. And then you have the tilt. The tilt can make a change on the seasons of the Earth. So if the tilt was higher than 23 and a half degrees, you would have warmer summers but cooler winters. And then if the tilt was lower than what we have now, your seasons would be less drastic. And then in terms of precession, what could happen is that the Earth can have its location of where its polar ice caps be different. And so what we can see from this graph here is that these three cycles occur on different time frames. The precession cycle takes about 25,000 years, the tilt cycle is about 42,000 years, and the eccentricity cycle is a whopping 100,000 years. When these three align in a sort of way, it can skew the Earth into what's called an ice age or a warming period. We have had five major ice ages 
in Earth's history. And we have also had major warming periods that usually coincide with the Ice Age. And what I mean by warming period is I'm talking about crocodiles that existed in Greenland. And what I mean by an Ice Age, I mean glaciers that have been as low as Southern California. So these are major climate differences that are caused by not humans, but different changes in the Earth's orbit, tilt, and where its north and south pole is. This is a graph that allows us to more clearly see the five ice ages that I've been talking about. We're actually still technically in our last ice age, the quaternary glaciation. And the causes of these ice ages usually connect with the Milankovitch cycles, but also the atmosphere's composition between the greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and the amount of oxygen that is there. So Earth is actually currently entering a cooling period, but climate change caused by humans has really changed this. Now 18,000 years ago, you can see here that most of Canada was just a glacier. Europe was completely cold. And this is a really cool gift that shows how ice, this isn't in real time of course, this is something that occurred years after years after years. One thing that's really crazy that ice caps can do is they, as more ice grows, more sunlight gets reflected back to space because of the albedo effect, which causes the Earth to become colder and then causes more ice to grow. This is called a positive feedback, and this is how we really make ourselves go into ice ages is as it gets a little bit colder, you can have more ice, and when you have more ice, you have more albedo effect, and when you have more albedo effect, you have mo less radiation absorb being absorbed by the Earth, and it just gets colder and colder, and it just gets out of control. It's also known as the snowball effect. But again, we're gonna talk about this more later on in the year when we get to geology. See that? Earth is the third planet from the sun. Oh, hey guys, Mr. Waz here. Dash and I are just checking up on our solar system and I'd like you to do that as well. I got four videos for you here that you should enjoy. Uh, check out the first one on Kepler's Law. That's a really great review for you. Also check out the one that allows you to explore the solar system. I had a lot of fun with that one myself. There's a good one that you can brush up with gravity. And last, there's also one that you can do to help you understand Milankovitch cycles. All right guys, thank you so much for watching and take care.